laser pointer. Um, but I thought I'd provide just a little bit of a couple background projects and then talk about this project that's actually in progress. Um, and, and we can go from there. <laughs> So this picture that you saw from the website, <laughs> this is a project um, that I think works to introduce what I do, because it's kind of clear. But to me, it's clear. But who are you? I, I think I wasn't here. Uh... Rebecca Beachy from Chicago. Hey! <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Andrea Kuklo from Düsseldorf. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I came here from uh, Vorpspiele and was there doing a workshop uh, for this pre-mortem festival that some a small group called Call out of Berlin was organizing and just spent um, a month there and just arrived here yesterday so um, been working on a few different projects and mm -hmm. just came back and I'm kind of like hey, <laughs> yeah. um, so this project was a, was a project with just really simple um, two big road lines that are a little bit exaggerated scale of what a, um, the, the dividing lines in, in the, between the traffic mm -hmm. in a street. And uh, ten, two 10 foot long road lines made up of just cremated down to just the white calcium uh, bones from roadkill. So there's kind of like a, a doubling that happens that reminds me a little bit of like somebody in earthworks at Michael Heiser or something like that. But it's just um, bringing that matter from the animals into the space in this different kind of scale, a little bit abstracted, but all the bones are the bones are from animals that I picked up off of the highway ah, that had been okay. hit by cars. Okay. Yeah. So this is a process that I like to um, play with with my work. Um, starting back at the beginning, I collect a lot of uh, animal parts and nests and bones and birds because I'm just really interested in natural history and in things that you can find and study and get close to and look at and learn from. And that desire eventually leads, for me, has led to um, having too much stuff, for one thing, wondering what I should be doing with these things I collect, and then um, wondering what the ethics are of having these things and then thinking about where they come from and thinking about the systems they're a part of and the ways that they have lives um, outside of uh, what they seem to be. Um, so this kind of has led to this practice that I often engage in in pulverizing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, one way to do it quickly with, with, with animal bones is to put them in a fire and cremate them and then use, use those ashes in different ways. I've also done it with um, piles of dust, making piles of dust from things uh, with uh, grinders and different methods and just breaking things apart, like making a whole bird's nest into just a mud. But I'll show some more images. Um, it has kind of a glow because the dust kind of, kind of spreads. So, um, I just came back from the horse pastures at Verbsfeed, where we're in this residency, always just looking out at the horses. And it has been really making me think of this last project that I did that actually connects to some of the work I did in Hamburg uh, with horse bones. This pile you see here, this enormous crate of horse bones, was actually pulled, these horses were pulled from Amish farms in Ohio. Um, these particular horses were used for labor, for uh, transporting people and things and tilling fields and all of that. And there's an artist before me that 
went out to the Amish farms where the horses go to die and just pulled all of the bones from the mud that he could possibly find and made a big parade float for a piece and paraded this parade float through town and then uh, left all of the pieces in a big crate for the trash. So I ended up, because I was working for this residency, I ended up being in responsibility for all of these bones and I didn't want them to be thrown away. So this is kind of how this project started, which is the way many of my projects start, which is kind of like this happenstance situation of coming into a certain type of material and then feeling responsible for it. Um, some of them I cleaned and sold. There are some nice skulls. Sorting them. Um, and many of them ended up getting cremated. So I was having lots of fires out there to try to process some of this material. This picture here, there are clearer ones. This one is uh, the teeth, just the teeth. Mm -hmm balanced on this tray on these kind of um, ash-casted um, pieces that I, I like to make these um, corners and kind of pieces of bricks of ash. You just mix them with water or glue and kind of they make these little structures. Let them dry. Um, but the majority of that material actually became a powder white fine powder that took a long time to process down to just the dust. Um, the, the firing of most of those bones happened in kilns actually at this point. I started out doing it in the landscape out in Ohio over regular fires and then it ended up, um, it's, it's so hard to get them hot enough to just burn out all the carbon because these bones are really large and heavy that uh, I started putting them in the kilns and that kind of creates this just really fine white. You put them there in kilns? Kiln. Kilns. What? Ceramic kilns. What is that? Uh, for firing pottery. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah, if, I, if you have language questions, just stop me. Okay. Um, so, I was given the space to use in, Ohio, in, uh, in Chicago, really raw. The, the bricks were missing from the walls, but it needed repaired with the grout. Um, they had just decided to put in this new floor, so it was a really interesting opportunity to treat this material in a different way. So I ended up actually patching the brick, uh, doing one whole round of patching the brick with the horse bones, making it into a mortar. So the bones actually ended up becoming part of the wall. And you can also see um, these bags that are hanging are like more of the, the pieces of the bone and the, um, this big pilaster is just one big strip of it. And uh, all throughout there are, they're kind of hidden in the walls are these, is this, uh, this, these calcium. And in places it's actually hard to distinguish from the, from the concrete, like in this picture where there's just these raw spaces. So in some places I actually put more um, obvious pieces of the bones in the wall. So this is actually a deer skull from Ohio as well. And, um, and I actually was able to cut a hole in the floor and make a second level below. These little tiny bones are from, um, from different animals, largely from finding roadkill or from doing taxidermy. I also practice taxidermy or preparation, as you all call it, I think. Um, recycling the body, looking at the bones. They become really clean and interesting to look at up close. And they go through the fire hot enough to where they're kind of s sort of stable, but still um, holding the form. Um, and then uh, embedding these different objects in the walls as well. This is like a little burned piece of the snail shell. And, uh, you can see some more parts. I was doing, I was, I was playing with this work in here, but I don't think I got the installation right. Like, mm. I didn't feel right about the way I set it up. I think this was part of partly resolving that. Um, but the whole, the whole piece, the whole room was kind of a meditation on these um, animals and also these kind of broken spaces. 
that have need that need fixing or that have been there for a long time and are falling apart and have a history that we can't completely know about. Um, this is the hole that I cut in the floor, and you can go down into this under under the ground space, and um, that area right there where there's something on this ledge, that's actually the pillows that I made in Hamburg from the, from the river birds. Mm -hmm. So they had a little home underneath the floor. Um, there ended up being some, and the, it would flood quite a bit too, so the water would come up, which I thought was interesting, through the, um, probably an unsafe building, but <laughs> the water would come up through this hole in the drain and um, then it would go back down and it would come back up and go back down. So it had kind of its own strange little underground tide. Uh, these are heat lamps that I use sometimes. They just emit like a red light. And then in the back is this object um, that's actually a taxidermy duck that has been kind of packed with this bird's nest mud. And by bird's nest mud, I mean bird's nest that I've turned into mush and then it becomes like its own mortar. But in this show, I also made a, I had a friend of mine who's an artist, this artist Judith Brotman, who writes these beautiful, interesting dreams that she, um, they're really funny and quirky. I had her write one for a sparrow and I rolled it up and I put it inside the sparrow and um, the intent was to hide this in the exhibition somewhere and just leave it. And what happened was, in the exhibition, before I had a chance to hide it, it completely disappeared. So I don't know, it went hidden, but I don't, hidden from me as well. <laughs> um, but the idea, the title of the show was called Inherencies, and um, part of what I was trying to dress with this is there is something inside of these buildings or inside of our bodies or we carry that we don't fully know or understand or isn't really ours even. Um, what was the title of the exhibition? Inherencies. So Inherencies. off of the words inherent. Okay, okay. Yeah. And there's, this isn't a very good picture, but there is a little Hamburg brick that I put in the wall of this space. So it's actually got one of the Hamburg river bricks permanently in the walls now, which um, this is why I think this project is leading to where I am now. That something about a little meditation on Hamburg went into the show. Um, I am kind of at a point where I'm tired of working with bones, but they just keep coming. <laughs> so I find myself still. There, there's something about them when they're so fragile like that that really after they've gone through the fire that really, um, they lose some of their physical weight so they feel less heavy, but they also um, are a reminder of how fragile we are in a different kind of way than the, than the bones when they, the horse bones especially, when they weigh, you know, I, I, I have um, not quite a ton left still, a whole lot of these bones, and I just recently um, had a chance the gallery is giving me a show where I'm going to be able to use the, mo the gallery's money to fire them in kilns to actually process all these bones. But um, I can't bring myself to sell them or to just throw them away. So it's this kind of partly like this way of dealing with the material. But there's something satisfying about that lightening of the, the weight. Um, in this exhibition as well, this is kind of transitioning into skin, which is where I am. Um, this is a really kind of strange result of skinning a cow <laughs> that died naturally in my friend's field. Um, they got, it, it was sick. Nobody knew how it died exactly. But the interesting thing about the way it turned out, not all the hair was removed. Some of the skin became rawhide. Some of it did get properly tanned. So it became kind of this interesting object that was neither one thing or another. And I showed you the light behind so you could kind of see the rawhide coming through, the light coming behind the rawhide. And did you put up the skin? Yeah. I just put one picture. I tried to pick a gentle one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so 
that's me, and it's a very intense physical process, skinning something this large. This is the first time that I did this. Um, and the way it turned out wasn't how I expected, but I did find the object interesting, and I'm kind of reprocessing, reprocessing it into different objects now. Uh, one thing that I'll <laughs> show you from over here is some of these patches that I'm considering using for this jacket project that I'm going to explain. This is actually the cow that, I, that I'm talking about, different versions of the, the cow that you're looking at up here. So this is where things come from, and it's really easy to forget the source, <laughs> which is why I'm putting this picture up here, because in order to explain what this is, which is what I'm, the project I'm working on now, I have to give a little bit of this history. The, the leather, that leather that you're handling started out with this process, which is really visceral and intense and physical, and somebody has to go through this process. Um, rewinding back to Frisa, <laughs> you all know Ula, right? Yeah, this, this project that I did at Frisa before involved uh, skinning a rabbit and making it into meat, and this rabbit skin became kind of a toy we were playing with. Um, and I did this, uh, did this experiment of combining the rabbit with little bits of bread that I chewed up in my mouth and then throwing it at the birds and they would dive and catch the bread in the air and it was this kind of fun game that we were playing last time I was in Hamburg. And I just wanted to give a little um, history of this time here. The, the river bricks. Um, this is the this is what kind of ended up leading into into the thinking that I've been doing since I left Hamburg, because I don't know where these bricks came from. There's no way of knowing exactly where these bricks came from, but they're so worked over by the river that it indicates that they might be from the war. Uh, Seventy years of being in the water after the war. Um, so I'm kind of becoming fascinated with these bricks and, you know, combining all these works into this riverbed piece with the pillows that I've sewn and the bricks and um, some of these worn away bits of styrofoam um, kind of floating in the space a little bit. And realizing that this relates to my personal history and um, this is not uh, to, if some people it might be emotional content, so I apologize for that in advance or if you're uncomfortable, that's okay. But my, my grandfather was a part of the bombing raids over Hamburg in 1943. So actually the anniversary of that will be July 25th. Um, so this is kind of where this uh, project has led to realizing that in my personal heritage, the destruction of Hamburg is connected, um, you know, after I've fallen in love with this place, it's really kind of hard to figure out um, Well, the stones may very well it. also be just a part of harbor construction. Exactly. Because, you know, when exactly. you break off a wall, there's no way, if it's near the water, right. you kind of catch all the bricks. And the exactitude of it isn't as important as the thought that there are that history is here, and it is maybe in the river, and it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's it's inherent in this place. Like it's it's still, and I, it's it's something that, from a distance, I have very little connection to. In the same way that before I skin the cow, I don't understand leather, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and so there's this connection that has been micro macrocosmic kind of thinking that I've been doing related to. Um, the distance between something that happened in the sky, how, how long ago was that, 1943? Um, 75 years ago, something like that. That was never seen on, that was never seen by my grandfather. He never witnessed what happened on the ground. So there's that distance between um, experience and um, experience. <laughs> uh, just, 
Okay, Th and this brings me to uh, this <clears throat> kind of roundabout story <coughs> which will lead me more into this. Um, back in Verbs Vita, this I was giving a talk about this jacket and my work and this woman approached me afterwards and I'm, I'm kind of, this is before I know that I have permission to use these horse bones and I'm finally going to move them out and away and be rid of this weight of all these bones. Um, this woman approaches me and says, I would really like to give you some owl pellets from my attic. And so I say, oh, okay, I guess I'll go to your attic and see these owls. So this is the hole that the owls come out of, these barn owls, and they've been living in this building for who knows how long, before this woman moved in. The house just kind of belongs to the barn owls more than to the family that lives underneath them, it seems like. Um, so I go over there and I, I you know, I pick up these owl pellets, and um, meanwhile, this is the, you know, I look out every day and I'm seeing these horses in the pastures, and, um, and I, when I go into this, meet this woman, I, I'm asking her about her life, and she, she, you know, what does your husband do? It turns out he's a horse doctor. And I go into his studio, and he has this strange target on the wall, mm -hmm. and also his, these bones hanging from his medicine cabinet, uh, articulated horse bones, actually in his um, workspace. And uh, I guess this is how they tranquilize the horses by they have to practice with a dart, dart gun to shoot the horses with tranquilizer. So it's like a healing dart, which is interesting and strange and um, I'm starting to think that there are some synchronicities going on here and um, um, yeah so so I'm, I'm picking up all of these owl pellets and I actually brought some of them too like I have three four or five bags of these owl pellets and um, what is actually is owl pellet it's what they if they eat something and they vomit uh, like the rest of the hand or what is mm -hmm. what is it pellet they swallow, they swallow animals whole, and they, everything they need gets digested, and then they vomit up mm -hmm. all the bones in a little package. So those are frozen, they don't have, they've already been frozen, so they don't have any parasites or anything on them if you want to pass it around, it's safe. <laughs> um, but I'll also just for the sake of... Because I, like I like to pass things around when I give talks. <laughs> These are some of the bones I already cleaned from inside of the horse, uh, the, sorry, the owl pellets. Oh. You can, yeah, they're little tiny, these are some of the little tiny skulls. From inside the bird's stomach. Yeah, okay. And we were just wondering because yeah. So the the horse doctor has just given me an enormous amount of bones, and probably way more bones than I've had to deal with with the um, <laughs> way more bones than I've had to confront with the horses because they're so small that there's an enormous quantity. Yeah. Little mice bones and uh, spitz, uh, spitzmouse, spitzmouse? Mm -hmm. spitzmouse, yeah, and um, a couple birds I found in there too. Little yeah, birds. <laughs> and so, the re part of the reason I'm mentioning this also because of synchronicity, but also because of the scale. There's something really interesting about the scale is so small, but it directly relates to these enormous other bones that I've been working with. And they are directly connected in this house, which is interesting as well. Um, so I'm not sure where this project will go yet with these little bones, but weaving around. <laughs> when, I, when I was actually giving my artist talk in Verbsvita, I was making sculptures out of ash. And uh, this, when I left the town, um, the one of the artist's daughters who was eight years old, she really wanted this bucket of ash, and I said, great, take it, play with the ash. And she started making these strange mandala target things as well, which I was like, okay, this is like landscape from above. It's some kind of like healing symbol. Like, I don't know, it's really strange that you just took my work and put it out into the, 
into the yard in this beautiful way on my last day in town. Um, but I'll weave back to that. This is a, these are these deer skins that um, became these pieces of leather that I, that I have here. So um, these two deer pelts come from a friend of mine in Wisconsin who hunts. And um, they were shot and eaten. And the skins were given to me raw with all of the flesh and the meat and all of that on the skin. And um, I decided to use these for this project that I'm coming around to explaining now, that I'm working on now. Uh, you know, stretching the skin and it's a really, and then this brings me to this object. Uh, but the process, the process of making leather is so um, time consuming, uh, laborious, um, kind of disgusting. You have to actually take the skin and put it in a shaver where all the stuff flecks off of it and um, it, takes, it takes hours to do, to shave it. And um, even after that, it has to go through different <coughs> chemical processes and cleaning and stretching and making it flexible and oiling it. And um, when I first saw this jacket, uh, I, I didn't really think about it much, but right after my grandfather passed away, he had been having um, nightmares about his, his missions over Hamburg and his 27 other missions that he did over Germany. Um, so that was interesting to me that all this time later, and in my work I'm thinking about air and flight and dreams and uh, these microcosm, macrocosm kind of incidents of violence and how they all connect and it seemed to lead me here to look at my own heritage more directly and this jacket kind of ended up becoming an object of study. So I put this jacket on and it fit me. It was really strange. It's kind of like a his frame was my frame. So I'm kind of putting myself in the position of what that must have felt like for him. Um, it's complicated, obviously, because I think my family thinks of this as a really heroic object, and I find it to be a really complicated object. Uh, <laughs> these emblems are, were painted on, the, on these jackets as uh, how many missions. So each bomb symbolizes one mission completed. And it was uh, <laughs> darts surrounding. And in, the middle, and in the middle, it's uh, Hell's Halo is one of the planes that he flew, and it's um, it's a devil dropping a bomb from the clouds. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. I just know one from uh, I've seen one one book with all this kind of jackets and this uh, kind yeah. of games. Um, right, and um, originally this is made out of uh, goat skin. Many of them were made out of horse horse hide. So this also connects back to the horses um, and this, dis this disconnect, this distance. Um, this is my grandfather <laughs> and me. So, <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, I never knew him as somebody who, you know, was in a war. <laughs> I never thought about war. There's these images. There, he's in his jacket before, it looks like it before it was ever involved in any. This emblem on the front also, it's uh, Uncle Sam dropping a bomb from the air. And these were really common, I, the different bomb groups all have their own different emblems that were painted on the jackets. So they're really treated like, um, like a real monument that you wear, that you, uh, kind of like a warrior object that's also a record of this experience. Uh, there he is in his jacket. He must have been 22. This is my studio back at Bergstita where I'm showing myself in this jacket and these ash sculptures, which the material presence of having that in the room seemed to be important to me. Um, because I work so materially, I wish in a way that I had been able to prepare the entire leather pieces over here, 
but something about that travel from the United States and bringing it here, there's still like a detachment, like a disconnect. It's, um, the fact that it's not completely direct is okay. <laughs> but um, show you this as well. I actually mapped these and um, you click, come back to it. I had these open from before. Well, anyhow, I have his combat journals that I've been going through and reading. And there's one here that's actually already open. Maybe that's, yeah, this is actually the one from Hamburg. So maybe you don't want to read that <laughs> right now, but it depends on hmm. if you feel. It's a really long time ago. You know, I was born after the war. Don't worry. I would be interested. Okay, in okay, I'll it. bring it up. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's because um, I'm learning this history for the first time. It's kind of like. Uh, and I know it's complicated, and the war is complicated, and Germans tend to be very comfortable with confronting World War II at this point. Um, well, we had to learn. You had to learn. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't get uh, what is the, uh, who wrote, what kind of texts are those? These are journals from, I need to zoom in. These are journals from my grandfather's missions. So he wrote these right after he... And they are, you can get them in the internet? Well, I made this little map. It's, it's not a broadcasted, but I can give you the link and you can look at this on your own. Yeah. And the journal is a private one or official from the mission? It's just his private journal. Ah, okay. It's not published anywhere. I have it in a packet. I scanned the pictures and put them online yeah. to share. Mm -hmm. With you, if you want to see, not with the world at large, but <laughs> that's, you know, maybe if this project comes to be exhibited or something, it'll become more of a thing. So, um, yeah, went for submarine works, smoke screens and fires started by the RAF the night before, obscured target, but we dropped the bombs. Bomb bay doors stuck in open position all the way out to the North Sea when we got down to altitude and wound them up by hand. The flak was intense, covering every inch of the sky. We took holes in both right and left stabilizers, right wing, and a big piece came in under the co-pilot, cut the control cables for number three and number four engines, left them running on 65% power, a nice safety device. We had four attacks by fighters from the nose, but they missed us and we missed them. I took a hopeless shot at a ME109F. Most outstanding feature of the air of the raid was the flak barrage. The Jerry's threw up everything they had. At interrogation, our co-pilot Jim Holman made a classic remark when he said, I want to report a flak gun out. I saw a four-inch space up there with no flak in it. When we were out over the nice North Sea, we feathered number four engine and left formation to evade their prop wash and conserve fuel. The gas gauges showed empty for 15 minutes. Before landing, we had to feather number three engine because we had no control over it. So we made a beautiful three-point landing on the two on the left two engines alone. Gerald did a splendid job on it. The crew was braced in the radio room for a crash landing. Stone almost passed out at the target at 27,000 feet when his mask froze up and he ripped it, getting it off. By pulling the tube and sucking on it, he was okay. It was a rough raid. So all of these have this really kind of flat 1940s diary style. And um, a lot of information condensed. And some of, this, some of this research has involved trying to figure out who these people are and what happened on these missions in the bigger, in the bigger picture, in the bigger perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, also, I was just in Bremen thinking about this as well. Mm -hmm. You know, each, and then I, you know, this makes it more convenient to kind of click on the map. And you found this diaries or at, at 
Did your grandfather stone or? Yeah, he he mm -hmm. um. He actually told me about his service. He passed away just a year or two ago, two years ago, um, after I was in Hamburg. So when I visited Hamburg, I talked to him on the phone, and he said, "Oh, you know, I bombed Hamburg." And I said, "Oh, I would." Wow, and he said, oh, yeah, I wrote it out in my combat log. I've got a diary entry on it. So he sent me just the page on Hamburg, mm -hmm. and I said, I want to see the rest of this. And and it was so, handwritten or over the... I, yeah, I have over, the, when we're done, I can mm -hmm. show you. I have over there um, just a photocopy of his handwritten, mm -hmm. his handwritten diary, and then also a packet that he typed out. This is just scans of his original typing, just making a packet for his own records. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and did he just do it privately, or did he have has to do it? Just did it privately. See, you can you can see um, if I get back to here, my combat record. Like it's really almost just for family, you know. And there's a little bit. He wrote his autobiography too, which is just a kind of a sweet, simple autobiography that he gave to all the grandchildren and children. Um, these accounts of my missions in the 8th Air Force 91st Bomb Group are copied verbatim from a little diary I kept in a three and a half inch by six inch notebook. Missing are the accounts of grades number 25, 26, and 27, my last three. They're missing because I got very superstitious about finishing my tour and for whatever reason I thought it would be bad luck to write about them. I had to fly 27 actual missions but got credit for 30 because they raised the tour from 25 to 30 after I'd flown 18. So, from what I understand now, it was very unusual to survive this many missions. Only one fourth of the people who did this survived. Mm -hmm. um, they were very dangerous, <laughs> I think, on all sides. I'm sure in Germany and France and Britain and all the different people who were in the air. Um, yeah, so I, I won't read through all of these, but. Um, Part of what I'm presenting today is that I don't, I'm not, this, this project is in progress. And it's a long process to, um, to make this jacket. And I'm going to turn the lights on. <laughs> so I can show you a little bit more. Like I've been, uh, you know, I, I, I made the collar piece and like, a pocket square and each piece with working leather takes so long to sew because it has to be sewn by hand and to get the this is all hand dyed pieces as well so you know it takes um, it takes time my friend Tony helped me make a pattern for the jacket from the original I borrowed it and uh, we cut pieces to match it as exactly as possible and um, so eventually this will be I have I've ordered some of some replacement parts for the original jackets when people want to replace the band or the zipper so I have the parts to kind of make it close to this right size and color and pieces and um, so far, I think it's kind of a meditation on this whole experience. Yeah. You mean people can order like replacement parts for these bombing jackets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like. They're treasured. They're worth like. So people. Thousands of dollars, if you as collectors' items, they're family treasures. They're like seen as like a like a really a powerful memory of the experience and like a like a medal or something, mm -hmm. like having this in your history. So they're, uh, they're kind of also now really important to fashion. Yeah, and I, just, I mean, it's a, some years ago, but I saw a book yeah. just about this bomber uh, jackets, and I was wondering. Uh -huh. They were all, they seem to be unique pieces. I mean, self, right. kind of self um, um, style. Right. Yeah. There and now you. They're they're symbol. They're symbolic of heroic American um, individualism and masculinity and power. And this. They're really 
have been adopted as a symbol of what it means to be American in a way. Mm-hmm. And uh, Top Gun with mm-hmm. Tom Cruise, you've all seen that movie, that really made the bomber jacket. Indiana Jones, he's wearing a kind of version of the A2, which is this jacket. So there's this hero myth already involved in this mm-hmm. object. And um, I haven't really pieced together, literally haven't pieced it together, and also in terms of the, con- the way that it needs to be finished, I haven't pieced that together yet either. But um, it's interesting to me to, to really take a long, slow meditation on the process of making leather because it's so intense. And then in this, in this way, this something that's so close to you, like your belt or your shoes, that you don't really mm-hmm. understand it. There's something inside of it that's completely foreign. I think that connects to these bigger, in a, if you blow it up, bigger experiences like war and, and you know, World War II was the first time that this wars were really conducted kind of in an abstract way. I mean, he was in the plane and terrified from these journal entries, but still, you know, doing his job. Um, but this was the first time when there was really these campaigns where you could just destroy enormous mm-hmm. landscapes from a distance without mm-hmm. having to see directly. And that's also so, so connected to the products that we use now and the fact that this, this you know, the bone, the burned bones might be kind of uncomfortable, but it's also the way we drink our water because our water is filtered through bones mm-hmm. to purify it. And it's like, there's, there's so many things where uh, the disconnect is so, enormous that um, these slow meditation seems important. I'm not quite sure if there's supposed to be my own speci- any specific emblems, like I was kind of playing with making these patches, but it seems inappropriate to put anything on them. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, I don't know so much about leather making, but I know that it's a quiet, uh, um, complicate chemical process also. Yeah, yeah. And did you also do this uh, yeah. like the normal uh, process, or did you invent, invent it by yourself? Well, I, I did not do... Uh, if I was really going to be amazing and, and all completely from scratch, I might try braining. And braining is when you use the animal's brain to tan the skin. And somehow it works... This is how it's been done a long time, yeah. it's it's. <laughs> Suddenly, the grocery store and your shoes become very dis- intense, right? Yeah. Yeah. The the brain. The, apparently, there's enough brain in every animal to just tan its to to, to okay. moisturize its skin and tan the skin. It's an old process where you actually mix up you mix up the brains of the animal and you apply it after you clean the skin, and then you smoke the skin in a fire smoke. So, so is there some, some But specific, I didn't use this method. Is there some specific chemical in the brain? A special conditioner that will work to tan skin. It's really mysterious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, I used, I used uh, taxidermy chemicals because I'm familiar with the taxidermy process. I think most, most of you already know that. Um, so you can order these things online and... and um, one question. Um, you use deer skin now. Is it for what reason? Um, or, or why? Just because you got it? Or is it because the wild animal is different in yeah. your opinion? Or it's, it's closer to something that's more natural? Or? I, I think that part of why I have the deer skin is because I have a connection to this hunter who has access to deer skin. Mm-hmm. And um, whereas with the patches, this was originally going to be the jacket, mm-hmm. this, this, hor- this, uh, cow. this cow. But the cow died naturally in a field. And I think also part of the reason why I couldn't fully tan it properly, first of all, it was my first time doing it. And I, I did it in a place where I didn't have running water. So the chemical part was hard to get right without carrying buckets um, <laughs> up and down a hill. Uh, so the domestic animal is still in here for me because these will be a part of it. The the wild the connection with the wild animal I I feel like that does matter, but I haven't fully. That's a good question. I haven't fully um, 
teased out what the difference is exactly. It's it's softer, I think, and it's well, the, thinner. It's the not texture so, is it's, closer it's, to the yeah. to the, the goat skin. It's closer to the horse huh? than the horse hide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I, it's interesting to me that the, some of the pieces actually have the bullet holes in them still. Mm -hmm. um, like these are, these are going to be the, the sleeves, you know. But I, they're all, it was a, it was kind of hard work to get, um, to get all of this, all of these pieces from just two deer pelts, mm -hmm. and so part of the jacket will have these little. Uh, wound, wounds in the leather yeah. and parts where the, the, the dye didn't quite take mm -hmm. perfectly or there's a little bit of a, of a whiskers mm -hmm. from a part where the dehairing solution didn't quite take all the hair out perfectly. So um, it's going to look a little bit like a ruin in a way mm -hmm. and, um, and a meditation on this experience maybe with this component of being able to read the diary entries and maybe a written component that I haven't fully pieced together yet. Mm -hmm. When I was working on it, it felt important to have these strange ash sculptures I was making in the room, so maybe there's a sculptural element that goes with it. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit less one-to-one, -one direct. Um, I'm just wondering, the, the Marin um, uh, trousers are from, from Dear. Um, the buckskin. This this is actually because I stretched it so fine. It's mm -hmm. almost like a hybrid between vellum and leather. Mm -hmm. Like um, part of it is because the tanning is difficult to get right, and mm -hmm. you you almost have to just baby it and be with these chemicals and stirring things and mm -hmm. timing things perfectly and testing the pH. And um, it's hard to do if you don't have like a month of time to sit with a bucket of chemicals. Um, but the, the quality of it, I like the way that it's a little bit darker than the original jacket. Mm. And um, has a, the, the leather, this is also from many years of wear. You can see in the earlier pictures, it started out really, oh wait, where are the earlier pictures? It started out really um, dark in color. Mm -hmm. A little bit deeper color. I don't have the, the color image. But you, if you look in the books, you see that it starts out really dark. Um, and it, it works out with the, most of the original jackets have all these little wrinkles in them too, from the, from the goat skin especially. So that works out in terms of this kind of vellum-y, thin buck skin. <laughs> It's going to be a process to actually get all these pieces sewn together. <laughs> so every piece has to be, you know, the, you roll out the little um, tool that measures all of the holes, and then you have to punch the holes, and then I don't have an industrial sewing machine. That's what I've done so far with those little pockets, pieces, and it, it probably will get sewn by hand. I might try it on my sewing machine at home with the right leather needles, but it might just not. I mean, you can buy special uh, leather needles, but as you have worked uh, so long on this process, I think it's uh, important. <laughs> <laughs> the special leather needles, I think they cut the leather. Yes, and that might not be so such a good idea for, for this. I mean, it goes also mm. afterwards mm. across the leather. Yes. Yeah. I also really like just these shapes mm -hmm. on their own, mm -hmm. and I had them up in my studio in Verbsfeda, and um, I could see some kind of presentation of this as a project mm -hmm. that's unfinished as well. Um, this is where, uh, when I thought first that it's just done in a way that you just, uh, yeah, cut it into pieces and show it in that. It might be, so, I mean, I'm still, uh, it's still a little it's bit of a collaboration with a friend of mine who works this way, Tony, his name is Tony Kerner, and he does mm -hmm. clothes and shoes, makes his own objects that are similar to this, so he helped me with the pattern. But he mm -hmm. tends to show his work in these, in these complicated ways with, 
elements of the process all along mm -hmm. um, as a part of the exhibition. And I, I like to do that as well, so I think when this finds a home, I'm, I'm almost like nervous to finish the pieces <laughs> because I like the fragments. And, and it's almost like making it whole again ties something up in a way that I'm not completely comfortable with mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. literally ties something up. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so part of, why, part of why I wanted to share this with you is because it's really interesting to be able to share the diary entries, so please find me if you want to read those more slowly on my Google, I'll send you a link on Google Drive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also um, to just have some response to where this project should be and where it should go. <laughs> mm. You know, like what, how this can manifest from your perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did you do in Bob's video? Um, I was working on this, but there was also another little mini story. Oh, why don't you tell that story you were... Um Starting a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. You might know already, but there, there was this this festival that a group of artists, um, feminist artist collective, they named themselves Call, out of Berlin, put on this festival called Premortem, and they invited me to Germany to be a part of this festival, knowing my work and the theme. Um, they also there was a spa component where you could go and get your get a foot massage or your nails painted, um, go in an outdoor spa. And then there was also these artist lectures and workshops and over a whole festival weekend. It was fun. It was raining the whole weekend, but it was fun. <laughs> but um, at Verbsfeeder, yeah, at this Kunstler house. Um, so my project was to do taxidermy on, um, to teach taxidermy using quail. And um, preparation, prep, uh -huh. preparation, yeah, so the original thought was just to get these birds from a butcher and, and ask nicely if the butcher would, would uh, kill them without destroying the skin and without gutting it and preparing all the pieces. And the butchers in the town and the village wouldn't do that. So. Um, the people working at the residency said, well, we're going to have to get, I think the, the solution to this is we just get some live birds and then you'll have to kill them yourself and we'll use them for the workshop. The whole idea, the whole process of this workshop was supposed to be skinning the birds, preparing them, and also cooking them and eating them and thinking about what all those things together mean mm -hmm. and um, spending time with the animal that you eat with its skin and its body and taxidermy takes so long that um, it really ends up being a meditation on that animal and um, I can bring up a picture of this, these birds too um, anyhow the what ended up happening was I, I was put in a position where I was asked to put the birds down myself yeah go and um, like, okay, this is more honest, maybe. We're going to be eating them, spending time with them, doing this. So we bought 11 birds live from a poultry mm -hmm. farmer. And I built a little pen for them and was taking care of them. And then when the workshop came, I killed five of them. And I did it privately in a bathroom, just kind of as quick as I could while preserving the skin. Um, and then we, I taught taxidermy on, with using these birds to four or five people, we saved the meat and cooked the meat a little later. But in the midst of all this, a um, journalist came in and uh, wanted to talk with me and talked with me and I didn't know who this person was, but I was telling her about the workshop that she didn't really understand English, so Tim Voss was uh, translating and suddenly this headline pops up in the newspaper, killing as performance with a big picture of me and my birds. And so the local veterinarian got upset, called the police. The police come and give me a thousand dollar fine, thousand euro fine. And there's four more articles in the newspaper about these birds and what I was doing or wasn't doing and what Tim was doing or wasn't doing and what the festival was about or 
all of them were really kind of bad articles that were confused and the town is just kind of at this point rolling in its own dialogue and the police just keep stopping by but nobody's really talking to me anymore. I, I wrote a response and sent it to the, the paper and they printed like a sentence from this like three page essay that I wrote. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, it's interesting though because this is a, a farming town and they have animals in their fields everywhere, cows, horses, uh, chickens, and I'm sure they must eat their own birds and mm. eat their own cows. Sure. But technically it's illegal to kill an animal without permission within the city limits, village limits, or whatever the county rules are. Yeah. So that was happening as I'm working on all this other project is, is negotiating the, with the police and with the town's people, village people. Mm. <laughs> I kept getting corrected for calling it a town. <laughs> They're very proud of their village. <laughs> but um, he, yeah, so this kind of brings this back, brings us back around to this thought that why should why shouldn't I have to experience the process of killing the birds if I'm eating the birds, if I'm using the birds aesthetically? Uh, it seemed like, okay, here you are, do it yourself, fine. And suddenly I'm an animal cruelty, you know, person. And it, it's just amazing. <laughs> so, so that was the experience in Bermuda. Did you have ever before any legal problems with bones or I was wondering in the States at any moment that people said, oh, she's working with bones and, you know, did you have any experience of that well, before? People are uncomfortable with this material sometimes, but the, yeah. the, legal, the legal things, um, not as much. Yeah, the, the, legal, the legal issue was new, but I'm also not native to Germany. I don't know the individual rules, so I was kind of just taking the word for it of the people who are researching this for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> part, of, part, of the, part of the point is people are, don't want to think about death or, or realize that death's a part of life. And part of what, um, one way that I've been supported in, in doing this work, and oh yeah, thank you for coming. Maybe we'll see you later, yeah. At the, at the Nature Museum in Chicago, I did this live taxidermy preparation mm -hmm. in front of families, and that's one place where I've had a lot of support for this because the institution has set up a system where you do all of your work in front of children and families and strangers, and they can come and talk to you and ask you questions. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually wrote an essay about this that was published in a collection in Chicago. Um, but that is like the museum is owning up to the fact that the objects in the museum come from a dead animal that has to go through this process to become a statue in a case. Mm -hmm. And those connections, they're willing to make those connections in that, in that mm -hmm. context, which I think is really healthy and interesting and progressive in terms of a museum institution mm -hmm. explaining a little bit what death is. Even if it's sterilized in a scientific kind of yeah. way, the kids have a really emotional reaction to this happening. And the, the adults often too. They don't. And then you say something like, "They say, ooh, that's so gross." And you say, "Well, did you know this is basically what a chicken is? Did you eat chicken this week?" And then they're like, "What? No." And mm -hmm. they want to be vegetarian after that. And th this whole revelation happens, you know, right in front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting for you to go to China <laughs> because uh, over there they have a really yeah, this is a very American thing too, um, this phenomenon. I'll show you some pictures from this process too, um, since I happen to have this <laughs> presentation here. My like friend Mariana prepared, made these images of me working on a pheasant. But this is the... <laughs> <laughs> this is the counter at the Nature Museum, and I love that kid's facial expressions, <laughs> making a little mannequin. And this is really amazing. Questions come up like, "Is it real? 
Did it die? Is it, is it alive? <laughs> Are you hurting it? <laughs> Just complete oblivion to what, what it is. And even things like this, like the fleshing, this is a very, very small scale version of what I did with the, with the big heavy skins. But what's happening there? I didn't get that. The flashing? There's a spinning wire wheel, mm -hmm. and he's going with this, this uh, squirrel skin, and zzz, 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 like like pulling it along the what the spinning wire wheel, so that it takes off a layer of the mm -hmm. of the skin, mm -hmm. with all the blood and the goo yeah, yeah, yeah. and all of that, and people can just watch, which I think is good, and the. You know, the, the museum doesn't get out of the responsibility either because the, muse, the museum is what's killing the birds. But they run into the windows. So there's no way out of, I always make a little drawing and measurements too. <laughs> there's no way out of the responsibility to it. It's a little tiny bird. What's with the needles there? They're just in there to hold things in place while, while it dries because the skin's still wet in that picture. Yeah. I actually have a process, too, that I'll tell you about while I'm talking about it. When I was making all these animals at the Nature Museum, without letting them know, I was hiding things in the birds. <laughs> so... Th what did you hide? This owl, actually, I asked an artist to kind of like I was curating this secret exhibition. Uh, if she wanted to put something inside of an owl, and she gave me a really strange uh, ob object, which was a, a tin of every fingernail and toenail that she cut when, for the time she lived in Baltimore. For some reason, when she was living in Baltimore, she saved all of her toenail and fingernail clippings. <laughs> and so her project was to put them inside of this owl, mm -hmm. which was funny. and. Mm -hmm. Worked fine for making a little package yes. that went inside the owl. So they don't know that. Don't tell them. Because maybe this will last for 200 years and you know, somebody will open it up someday. Some and 300 years from now and say, <laughs> <laughs> I started out putting matchsticks in them because I felt like I needed a little symbolic gesture to make me feel like they weren't going to be imprisoned as a piece of taxidermy forever. So just a symbolic gesture of like, this is impermanent, putting a matchstick in here. I did that with like 20, my first 20 birds, I think, that I did for the museum. Um, they don't know that either. I'm confessing <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, that became that. These are just some other pieces that I've done. Hmm. And did you um, learn by yourself, or did you do a course or something? I, I learned from the man you saw, actually, with the squirrel skin. <laughs> He's a curator. Yeah. Is it the Field Museum? The Nature Museum, yeah. This is that bird's nest mud, too. <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, that's pretty, what, pretty much what I have to present. I don't know if you have more questions or if just like happy to listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to have you listen. <laughs> and also maybe to get your information if you want to follow the project more, read this diary entries more privately. Yeah, the I mean, the packets are over there. Could send the link to this. To the, yeah, I will do that. Mm. Maybe I'll send it to... Yeah, and you want to publish the diary one day, really, or...? Well, if, if this project becomes more solid as a presentable project mm. that's ready to go, mm. maybe there'll be a little publication, mm. but not, not, not necessarily like calling up the historical society. I mean, this kind of thing is online. When I started to do this research, this kind of thing is... Um, People put their grandfather's diary entries online and little WordPress things and mm. blog and blog entries. And mm. It's not that uncommon to find the mm. material from private people's journals. But it's uh, what I really, uh, for me, it's interesting. Uh, knowing your work, you did here three years ago, mm -hmm. 
and now it connects to something new for me because now it con connects to history and to your family history and uh, that's a very interesting movement in your work so I'm very happy that I learned this today and it's for me also personally very interesting because my very very first piece I did as an art student was about this uh, fire bomb, bomb night mm -hmm. uh, in Hamburg 43 uh, something on the uh, it might be the, end, the anniversary like mm -hmm. tomorrow or today mm -hmm. of that because mm -hmm. he did his thing on the 25th mm -hmm. and they came in the day after the, the firebombing from the RAF mm -hmm. so he was the second wave. Mm -hmm. um, there's this big graveyard in Hamburg in Ohlsdorf, you have been there once mm -hmm. and there's a big monument for the victims, have you seen this? I need to go. Oh, uh, you should go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my documentary, I did that in yeah, 86, 87, the winter of 86, 87, was about this monument. And my approach was a little bit like yours. I came from somewhere else. Yeah. I was interested in, the, in an artist called Gerhard Marx, the German artist, the sculptures. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, met his work first time in the, in the archive of the Kunsthalle. So there's this graphic archive, you can go in, and I was looking for something to copy. I wanted to learn how to draw, and then I, there, there was the face, the, the graphic, the hand uh, with a pencil, and I, I liked the face, it was really interesting. And it was not like a normal drawing, it was like more like somebody making lines down, down. and it was like material. You had the feeling, okay, well that's not a, a painter or a graphic artist, mm -hmm. that must be something else. And then I learned a lot about his drawing and then I asked my, my teacher, could I see a sculpture? And he said, yeah, that's one in old stuff. And I went there and was really deeply impressed, moved, and, mm -hmm. and then I uh, yeah, did a little thing. I never showed him, I, and nobody saw it <laughs> till now. So really, no, no, nobody. Mm -hmm. Even not my, my friends, my family, nobody. It's a really secret, and uh, maybe I show it to you. Yeah. Oh. yeah. It's, it's just trade secrets with you. Yes. <laughs> I was just thinking, um, also what, what you just said about collecting the work of I saw of you when you were here last time, with mm -hmm. the because that struck me really too, and I thought um, one thing you said like at least two times was the, like, or three times, uh, something like we don't get out of the responsibility. You're, you said it differently, but something like, you know, no matter what you do, part of we are in it together, yeah, you know, exactly. we cannot say, no, no, you know, now I'm vegan, so now I'm fine, you know, now I'm clean. No, you're never clean, right? So that's yeah. one thing which I think is really interesting. And the other thing, and it's so interesting, the connection between the two things make me think a lot, um, trespassing this invisible border um, of, what is acceptable within the mainstream, you know, like we don't see uh, the blood and all the things that make us fear and disgust, and yeah. things, you know, and uh, when you trespass that, um, police comes in Germany, that's so interesting, you know, um, it's just, it's rather, I don't have like a specific point, but those two things together um, really resonate with me, and, and I think that's, I have to digest it, but um, viscerally. Viscerally. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, and like that. yeah. In a way, I, I wish I had recorded more of the process of making the leather photographically, but um, I was really trying to do it fast and <laughs> didn't mm -hmm. want to. The intensity of having this heavy, heavy animal skin that's not clean just makes you want to finish cleaning it as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and it and it's, is physically like laborious to lift it and shave it and scrape it and it, you, it's just it's not mm -hmm. yeah it's, there's a reason why even commercial taxidermists will send their skins to a professional tannery because um, it's just not pleasant to do it yourself yeah I mean they'll still flesh things out themselves but it, it, it takes the practice to do it quickly and it takes some um, physical muscle and 
space to, yeah. Mm. Mm. I was just wondering, what's the word for ego in English? If you like disgust, is it disgust? Mm -hmm. Disgust. Because disgust is something really, it's like a physical reaction, it's very complicated to mm -hmm. resist it, but it's a social phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You know, little children don't feel disgust when they see poo or things, you know, mm -hmm. children don't feel disgust. It's a social phenomenon, but it's a social bodily reaction, which it's almost impossible to control if you see a corpse and you start to vomit. It's almost impossible to to resist that that impulse. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting to think about the like visceral social reactions we have towards things mm -hmm. and the possible connection to responsibility which might be connected to it. I, I don't know what it's like. It looks yeah. like it makes me think it's, it's so interesting. It's yeah. even more just that you're you're already responsible because you're already inside of it. It's not necessarily something you have to take responsibility for, it's, mm -hmm. it's, we're already, in, in history, you know. You don't choose the responsibility, you know, it's right, you're mm -hmm. inside of it, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so you can either acknowledge it or not acknowledge it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the question is, and then do what, right? And that's, that's so interesting, yeah. <laughs> hmm. um, do what? <laughs> well. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Thanks for listening. <laughs>